Welcome into this episode of Mondays in Midtown. I'm your host, Willie McKenna, and obviously we have some strange things going on here at Mondays in Midtown. As no, I am not tired this evening, but I do in fact have eyeliner on for unknown reasons that I'm not going to go in and talk about right now, as that is not what we were here for. And we're also sitting in the middle of a forest. So with those issues not addressed, let's go ahead and take a look at our very first panel of today's episode, and that's going to be about homelessness in St. Louis. First off, our Amanda, Hunt Amanda Huntingfort sat down with two of our panelists, one of them being Stephanie Schmidt from the Peter and Paul Community Service, the second being Tony Hilkin from Places for People. Let's go take a look at that. Thanks, Willie. I'm here with Stephanie Schmidt from Peter and Paul Community Services and Tony Hilkin from Places for People. Um, I'd like to start by asking both of you to paint a brief picture of the state of homelessness in St. Louis. Um, what does the problem really look like? I know there's probably a lot of stereotypes, a lot of false ideas. It's really What's true. the reality? So there are a lot of homeless people in the city of St. Louis and in the surrounding counties. Often people think that there are no homeless people in the county, that everybody who's homeless comes to the city. That just isn't true. Um, there's also a stereotype that they're primarily homeless men. Um, while in the city there are more homeless men than women, um, there are also many, many homeless mothers with their children um, who live on the streets or in the shelters um, in both the city and the county. Um, one of the surprising things when you think about homelessness in St. Louis is that there are about 1,825 people in any given year who qualify as chronically homeless. That means that they are single people who are over 18 who live um, in either the streets or another place unfit for human habitation for more than a calendar year. Um, and I think that's always sort of shocking for people because you think about when do I have a year to give up of my life? You know, how would I make it if for an entire year, you know, my whole life stopped? Um, the other qualification could be that you were homeless four distinct times um, in three years. Again, like when do you have time for that in your life to sort of be productive, go to school? Um, you know, if so we talk about, oh, sometimes, you know, we should demand more of the homeless and they'll get better. Um, but people don't recognize the reality of how hard sort of their lives are and, and the things that, and all the supports that they need uh, to get get sort of reorganized. The other thing that's really surprising about homelessness in the, both the city of St. Louis and then sort of nationally is that we tend to think about homeless adults. And many, many more children are homeless than adults. So the average age of a homeless person in the United States is eight. Um, not 80, not 18, eight. Um, and so that, again, puts sort of more of a, that like feel bad moral impetus on like really when we look at our homeless population, they're more, most likely to be children. And you really point to the, the subpopulation that are moving from, that are very transient and move from location to location, and that, that location may be someone else's apartment or a family's apartment, but there's no ownership, there's no rent being paid. Um, they are just, they're without income, um, without sort of a home base, and Unfortunately, you know, potentially moving from week to week or month to month um, with no address, which, um, yeah, if we can just think about the mail that we get or um, just the significance of having an address and having somewhere that we can go to that is, is home base. Um, and that's, that's a, a very significant subpopulation of the homeless, that, that transient population. Right. So. There's the obvious reason of a person in need to help, but why else might someone want help to um, end homelessness? Well, there's lots of reasons to consider ending homelessness, and part of it, I think that is important for us to recognize that there's a difference between ending homelessness and managing homelessness. So ending homelessness is really taking someone and giving them a home. What they need is a home. And like Tony said, we all need a home base and making sure that happens. Um, this differentiates from managing homelessness, which is we'll give you, you know, sort of temporary shelter, we'll give you just a little bit of money here, just a little bit of help there, and we sort of string people along um, in the process of homelessness versus trying to actually get people out. Um, so the problem when people are sort of strung along in, this, in the system of homelessness is that they continue to not generally participate in the economic viability of the community, which means that either they're not working or they're under uh, employed, 
which means they're not paying the taxes that they could be um, to sort of participate. They're taking up tax dollars. Um, people who are chronically homeless, the, the people we talked about earlier who about, you know, what is that, 1,850, uh, 1,825 in the city uh, and the surrounding areas, those 10% of generally all of the homeless people take up about 50% of the resources. So those people in sort of being strung out over time to remain in the system of homelessness don't ever, uh, you know, get the things that they need and they take a lot of our money to do it. Um, so we'd actually be much better served by using our money a little bit more wisely um, and trying to really end homelessness for people. And there are, there are some great programs out there. Um, transitional housing comes to mind. Um, it really is a movement that I hope that um, the city and state um, are moving in the direction of and looking at more um, services offered through trans transitional housing than that emergency mm -hmm. shelter because that is, like Stephanie is saying, um, more of a management tool. Um, there's also permanent supportive housing um, that seems to be growing by the year, um, which generally a, a client or an individual needs to be part of an organization, but once they become part of an organization, they have this opportunity to be a part of permanent supportive housing. Um, so there are, there are, there is that potential um, for housing for the homeless. Um, it's just sort of a matter of linking to a specific agency and, and doing some work. Um, because the other part is, is that we just can't offer services, services at free will. There, there needs to be sort of this collaboration between the client and staff of these agencies um, to be successful in these programs. Mm -hmm. So how easy is it to become homeless? Is this, or I assume there's a wide range of ways that people can become homeless. Absolutely. Would you say that every student here would have the possibility of finding themselves homeless at some point in their life? It's, it's true, it's absolutely true. And I'm here to tell you if you're listening to this, you believe it cannot happen to you. In the same way I believe it cannot happen to me. The bottom line is that is a complete falsehood. Um, there, I, I know so many people who are college educated, and that's people's number one response, typically when we talk to college kids, but I have a college education. Yeah, a lot of my clients have a college education. It's not what protects you. Um, there's, and again, like you said, there's any number of reasons that people be, can become homeless, and a lot of those are not um, predictable. So sometimes that's a serious health issue that you have, or a serious health issue that one of your family members has. That can be, and that can include drug or alcohol abuse. You know, there's all of this um, sort of emerging proof to show that your genetics have much more power in whether or not you, you know, you become um, addicted to drug or alcohol um, substances than, than we would like to think. We like to think it's a weakness of will, um, but there's actually all this information out there to show that some people drink once and they are completely hooked for life, you know, and there's, there, because of that, there are things we need to do, extra supports we need to give them to sort of help them um, overcome that. Uh, but yeah, there's any number of reasons that people become homeless. Um, they're underemployed, their job market. Um, you know, I have a friend who's a pilot who graduated from Parks here. Um, you know, the airline industry hasn't been going really well lately. So he's actually doing something completely different outside of um, aviation. He is not making a lot of money. Um, and he always said, like, I thought I was going to, you know, by this time working for some major airline, great benefits, doing all this good stuff. Um, and it's just not true, you know, and I think one of the things that is the most helpful for me to remember in working with people is that most people, almost no people actually choose homelessness. There's some people that like it, you know, there definitely are, and that they prefer to live that way. 99.9% .9 of the people do not want to be homeless. They didn't want to become homeless in the first place, and they don't want to become home, they don't want to stay homeless. Um, so, you know, there are people that want to actively partner and collaborate, like Tony said. Um, and I think our goal and our effort should really be trying to find how we can partner with those people for two reasons. One, it helps them. The other reason is it helps us. And sort of it goes back, like, you know, what we talked about earlier, it goes back to, you know, uh, our tax dollars being spent. It goes back to our property values being affected. You know, it goes back to you know, our community being all that it could be. You know, we are, I don't know, I guess this is sort of up for debate, but 
you know, many people would say were still sort of the economic engine of the world, sort of, you know, the beacon on the hill. So part of that is if we don't lift all of us up together, it's pretty, pretty unlikely that we're going to stop other people from falling um, into the same traps. The bottom line is some of the people that fall into homelessness will have gone to slew. Wow. Uh, just a little bit on, on my end, um, I, I think a lot of what Stephanie is talking about is situational homelessness. And mm -hmm. um, for a large part, with the organization that I'm working with and past organizations that I've worked with, um, I always found homelessness to be associated with either mental health or substance abuse. Um, we are finding in this, um, just in the last year, we, we have found because of the, the housing crisis and because of the economic shifts that situational homelessness is coming back. Um, and I think mm -hmm. it's been a profound, um, profound situation in terms of not only our economy, but how we view homelessness. That's really true. So I think there's been an ongoing debate on whether or not it's a good idea to give to panhandlers. What have both of you found to be the best course of action? You know, um, it's, I've been doing this for 14 years now and it's still um, not an easy decision for me. Um, <laughs> um, it, it, I guess a big part is, um, is getting more information on why, why they're asking for the money. Um, go with your gut reaction. Um, do you believe the story or not? But um, you know, 80% of the time, that that money is going to alcohol or drugs. That's just the reality of who's asking for money. Um, you may really feed someone that evening, or it it may go towards a bus ticket. But um, it's really up to you all to um, gauge um, what's what's appropriate in that situation. And um, you know, the reality is is that SLU University is in, in the middle of pretty much the Central West End, and, and that is a very diverse um, part of the city. And so we are going to be approached by homeless individuals, or maybe not even homeless individuals. Um, but you really just need to use your judgment on that. Yeah, it's true. There's a great campaign in Chicago called the Wise Charity Campaign. Um, and I'd heard about it several years ago, and it's really interesting. And what they said is, again, sort of looking at a wise investment of our resources, our goal cannot be to manage homelessness. Our goal can be to end it. And we're never going to end homelessness for people that come up to us or, and ask for money. Um, one of the things that we can do, though, is we can, if you, there's somebody that you see on the street, who you've seen a couple times, if you try to get to know that person, um, understand who they are, understand the hardships that they go through, um, you may be able to figure out what those people need, um, and we can actually meet their need versus sort of, again, sort of helping to string them along. Mm -hmm. I never give money to panhandlers ever. That's just my own personal belief. Um, that's what's encouraged by the Wise Charity Campaign is to never ask and get, or give money to people that sort of walk up that you don't know to ask you, unless you take the time to get to know them um, sort of over, over the course of time. Um, the other things and other strategies that sometimes I'll use is uh, I used to carry McDonald's like gift cards, like the, you know, the dollar you know, certificates in my purse, and I would offer that to people. Um, more often than not, they would not take them. Um, I've also you know, said, hey, I won't give you money, but I'll buy you something to eat if they want that. Um, again, more often than not, people will turn you down and just sort of move on. Uh, part of the thing for you to know is that, you know, it's people ask for money for all sorts of different reasons. And like Tony said, some of those reasons are really valid and some of those reasons aren't. Um, but if people really need, have a need that they need met, so say they're asking for like, I need money for the bus. People do need money for the bus. You absolutely need money for the bus. But if you offer them a bus ticket and they won't take it, then that tells you something about the situation. Again, like most of the people that we uh, work with, they're, they're good people. I, I want to be very clear about that. Very, people who are homeless are just in a bad situation, and they're doing their best to deal with that. Um, but oftentimes, <clears throat> we should really think about the way that we help and to determine if that's really helping or hindering this situation. So what um, would you both say is the best way um, for someone to help the homeless, especially someone who, like many of our um, viewers, don't have a lot of time or resources on their hands? 
Um, I think, Steph, you said it best, um, getting to know the population better. Um, and, and that doesn't have, it can be that specific individual or it just can be volunteering. Um, um, there's many opportunities I, I, through um, campus ministry um, at different shelters, at different mental health providers, um, I'm sure at different ADA providers, uh, substance abuse providers. So just that exposure, um, sort of learning, um, learning the population better. Um, just you know, like you learn from from your books. This is just a little bit more hands-on. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, getting your feet wet with that is definitely definitely gonna um, make a make a huge difference in in how you deal with situations with with homeless or people that are you know chronically mentally ill or or whoever's um, that we're coming across. It's true. So I actually went to SLU in the spirit of full disclosure. Um, <clears throat> so I know a little bit more about, you know, I think many people here, right, we're here for the greater glory of God. We're here for, you know, to be men and women for others. And so as part of that, almost every student at SLU does volunteer. I don't have any statistics about that, but I believe that to be true. I know that is promoted a lot by different service organizations, sororities, fraternities, groups, clubs. Um, so like Tony said, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and in the end, what we need is we need people to go and volunteer where their heart is because when you really find something that speaks to you, um, you're going to be an asset to the community, however that looks. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, I, I have a lot of students that come to my agency, um, many from SLU, and I think when they come in, they're afraid. I think is typically the sort of approach like, oh my gosh, homeless people are going to hurt me. That's generally not true. They're much more likely to be the victims than to victimize. Um, you know, and I think they also just, you know, a lot of students just really feel like the homeless are so far from them. Like Tony said, even though they may physically live all around SLU, I, I know when I was here as an undergrad, we thought, oh gosh, like we're so far away from that. Don't you know, like I live in Walsh. <laughs> I did live in Walsh. but. Um, <clears throat> You know, I think it's important for us, like Tony said, to just try to get out there and meet somebody. You know, once you have actually met somebody and seen like how lovely the folks are that we work with, it's really hard to turn their, your back on them. It's really hard to, um, you know, just stay the same way that you are. I think one of the real challenges and charges um, that SLU, I think, does a great job of promoting is like know your world, be part of your world, be doing something about your world. You know, they sort of th think globally and act locally. Um, you, you don't have to go very far from SLU to find homeless people or to find homeless services agencies who are making real and sustainable change in the lives of the people that walk all around us. So that's what I would really encourage people to do, yes, just to get out and volunteer. You know, and there are times, all times of the day or night, um, you know, like there are people that are needed to be at shelters overnight. So if you think, oh, I'm so busy, you know, I work, I go to school from nine until seven. Well, conveniently, shelters are open from seven at night to nine in the morning. If you're a person that doesn't need a lot of sleep, like I was in school. <laughs> <laughs> that would be perfect. All right, Stephanie Schmidt from Peter and Paul Community Services and Tony Hilkin from Places for People. Thank you very much for coming on Mondays in Midtown. We really appreciate it. Great, thanks, bye. Thank you, Amanda, Stephanie, and Tony, for that look at homelessness in the St. Louis area. Hopefully that will raise, raise some awareness for all of those who don't know too much about the homeless shelters around the area. Coming up next, we're going to go ahead and uh, head over to Avis Meyer's desk and hear some of his stories from his news career. Woodward was asked another question, he asked if he had any Ben Bradley stories that weren't in his book, weren't in Ben Bradley's book and weren't in any Bernstein's book, or his or Bernstein's book. He said a couple. Um, both of these are memorable. If you don't know who Ben Bradley is and you're watching this, you should. Bradley said that when they were doing Watergate, at one time, if you don't know the story, you should. 
and most people doing this, watching this tape will probably know. During the Watergate investigation, Kate Graham, who owned the Washington Post and Newsweek, had Bradley into her office. And she said, what can you tell about Watergate? And he said, what do you need to know is not in the paper. And he said, she said, who's Deep Throat? And he said, I don't know. He said, who knows? He said, Woodward knows. Anybody else know? No. He said, you, are you sure you trust him? He said, yes. He said, Woodward trusts him, and you trust Woodward? Yes. And she said, and I have to trust you? And yes. And she said, would you trust him with your job? Because you are. Bradley said, I would. And she said, would you trust him with my paper? Because you are. Bradley said, I would. She said, okay. She said, keep me informed, and that was all the conversation. Afterwards, Woodward asked me about this. He ran the conversation by him, just as I did this camera. And then Bradley had this comment to make, which I thought was the greatest comment you can make about a publisher. He said, Kate Graham is the ideal publisher for a journalist. She's hands off and mind on. I've never heard any other publisher talked about that way. Another Bradley story that's out of his book uh, that Woodward referred to, and I've read the book so I knew this was coming. He had written something about the Kennedy family, and this is long after JFK was assassinated. He'd worked with Bobby Kennedy and been John Kennedy's friend. He knew the family. But it was kind of a little bit defrocking some of the romance of the Kennedy era. And Kay Graham was a good friend of the Kennedy family. And he had been called in, he thought, to be raked over the coals for writing a rough story about the Kennedys, but he was wrong. And the conversation is in his book, but Woodward talked about it that day as well. So he went in to see the boss, expecting to be told, how would you like to work at the Washington Post, and how would you like to not write anything else about the Kennedy family that makes them look bad? But that's not what happened. Instead, she said, I have a op- proposition for it. He said, what's that? She said, how would you like to be the managing editor of the Washington Post starting next month? And without thinking, Bradley blurted out, I'd give my left nut. And she said, I beg your pardon? He said, that means yes. And she said, good, and got up and walked out of the room, blushing and turning red, but she didn't say a word. Ben Bradley's book, which is called A Good Life, is Good Life. It's, good. it's a good read. Bradley, Bradley and, and Woodward worked together for years, and Woodward said it's one of his favorite books. Another Woodward story. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, he said that the moment that was the scariest moment in the entire Watergate investigation was when, again, for people who don't know this story, this may be unnecessarily complicated. They, were, had, they thought the name of the Attorney General, the ex-Attorney General of the United States, John Mitchell, down flat, as one of the people distributing money illegally. The Attorney General, the ex-Attorney General, distributing illegal money. It turned out they were right, but they thought they were wrong because what they said was that so-and-so had named it to the grand jury, and they had not. Those people had not named the grand jury. They found out later that he, they, were not, they were not asked to name Mitchell, and they were not asked because somebody in power, we think Haldeman or Nixon said, don't ask, so no one did. So the story was actually right, but not wrong. Um, they called, when they were called into Bradley's office, Bradley used that famous word in journalism circles. He called both of them by one name when he shouted across the newsroom, and it was a must have been a scary moment. He said, Woodstein, because he thought the story was wrong. So Woodward and Bernstein walk into his room, and I'm going to clean this up a little bit from what Bernstein and what Bernstein and Woodward both said. He said, what the F is going on here? And they explained to him that so-and-so said that, that Mitchell was one of the guys controlling the phone on this money illegally. He said, but this guy on TV says he didn't name him. He said, you may have screwed up this paper, this entire, this entire investigation. And Bernstein and Woodward both nodded, and then Bernstein said, well, if we're wrong, we're resigned. And Bradley exploded, and I'm going to clean this up. He said, who gives a F if you'd resign? You guys are kids. You're in your 20s. All of us are in our 50s. This is the end of our career, our life, and we hung everything on your shoulders. He said, get the F out of my sight now. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I can't stand the sight of you. So they walked out of the room, down the office, down to the elevator, didn't say a word. Everybody in the building was staring at him because everybody heard this conversation. They'd never been so thoroughly humiliated in their life. The guy on the elevator, Bernstein turned to Woodward and said, I kind of want to be an architect anyway. And Woodward says, yeah, I guess I'll go to law school. But 24 hours later, it turned out they were right. And that's, the, that's how things turned out. Thank you, Dr. Meyer, for that look at uh, the always interesting stories of newspaper writing. Finally, we're going to finish up with Dr. Z. Schaefer, but before we go, we want to remind you that if you have any stories, comments, questions, uh, things about eyeliner trees, 
anything that you want to talk to us about, go ahead and shoot us an email at mondaysinmidtown at gmail.com. Also, take a look at our Facebook page as you'll be finding weekly updates and you can see our YouTube channel and all that kind of stuff to watch Mondays in Midtown over and over and over as I know that you're going to be doing. Coming up next, we're going to have Dr. Z. Schaefer with Communicating. Good morning. Today I want to talk a little bit about conflict management, management excuse me, because it's one of those skills that few people think about, but yet it's something we all use every day. In the United States, an average working person engages in about nine different conflicts each day. Um, conflict defined as a disagreement between two or more interdependent parties trying to accomplish some goal. So for some people, when they hear the word conflict, they immediately think of hostility, arguments, fighting, negativity, etc. So what I encourage my students in my conflict mediation and negotiation course is to identify which conflict management style they currently use and to switch that style to something else for a few specific reasons. According to traditional research, there are five different general styles. They are competitive, collaborative, compromising, avoiding, and accommodating. So I say to students, figure out which of those styles you most frequently use and switch it in um, an ongoing conflict. This will make you feel uncomfortable, but I tell them to reflect, journal about that process, write down the expectations for what you thought was going to happen, and then write down what actually happened. I sort of got the idea from the movie Fight Club, where Edward Norton instructs everyone to go out and start a fight. Well, I'm not instructing people to do that. I'm instructing them to switch their conflict management style so they can see that more than one style is effective. So if we part start putting a little more conscious thought into how we deal with conflict, which really boils, boils down to how we communicate with others, your life will be much easier and much more well-organized. Thank you.